Hello, everybody. I'm Gloria Copeland, and welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory. Billy Brim's back, and she's got some th good things to us about Jesus. He's coming. He's coming. Glory to God. Maybe she'll tell us when. We'll be. We'll just see. <laughs> welcome, Billy. Thank you very much. Uh, Gloria, you know, he will come on God's yes. calendar. Yes, he will. God has a calendar he keeps. And it's not the Gregorian calendar. It's not the Mayan calendar. It's not the old Roman calendar. It is the God calendar. And it's in Leviticus chapter 23. And we're in the highest holy days right now of that calendar. We're in, we're in the epitome of it. Um, there are at the beginning of the sacred calendar, there are four fulfilled feasts already. Fulfilled moeds, dates on God's calendar, Passover, um, right on down to Pentecost. Now we're coming to what is the new year, the new sacred year on God's calendar. And this new year on God's calendar, the, uh, actually the civil year begins on God's calendar. It's the seventh month of the sacred calendar but it's the first month of the civil calendar. And we had the beginning of it on Rosh Hashanah. Mm. Uh, that was the, you know, God, He, the evening and the morning were the first day. And it's still like that for the Jews and for this calendar. The evening and the morning make up the day. So, one week ago on Rosh Hashanah, uh, in the evening of the September 13th, uh, and then the morning of September 14 is the first day of this civil year. And we begin now the highest holy days of the whole calendar. They're all within just a few days of each other in the same month. There was a partial eclipse on that day. Now we are approaching one week later, we're going to see the final blood moon eclipse of the Tetrad. That's going to be on um, Sukkot, the 28th. The 28th. Of, of uh, Sukkot. Now. So is that in my, in my vernacular, is that tabernacles, September? Tabernacles. September 28th. September yes. September 28th. Okay. So that's a blood moon and we'll be talking to you when you can see it and where you can see it. But right now we're on the 21st of uh, the month of September in our calendar. It's the eighth day of this new year for Israel, new year for God. And uh, tomorrow on the 22nd of September, Erev means evening. We'll have the evening of Yom Kippur and 23rd will be the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And then we're going to go down to the 27th of um, September and the 28th, we begin our second week on the 28th and that's gonna be the blood moon. This is called Sukkot in Hebrew, and it, to us it is tabernacles. So um, the Feast of Tabernacles, which has not been fulfilled, will be fulfilled and the Jubilee will come when Jesus comes, the Messiah comes, and sets up His kingdom on the earth. So um, what we're into right now is that high holy days, and we're going to look particularly at prophecy, Without the Old Testament prophets, you really cannot look at our times. And we're going to look at one of the prophets, which particularly speaks about that coming time, that coming kingdom on the earth, that coming glory on the earth. We're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel. And we're, we're going to be looking, now we're looking at the calendar. God set this calendar and he gave it to the Jews to keep. You cannot understand Bible prophecy. You cannot look at what's going to happen here, Gloria, know what's going to happen unless you recognize Israel and that it is God's time clock. I was once in, in, uh, in Finland, Helsinki, Finland, and I saw this guy with a jeans jacket on and he had a great big clock on the back of that jeans jacket, kind of like a homemade clock. And he had the hands up there, almost 12. And he had across the top of it, Israel, God's time clock. And it is. If you want to know the times, if you're interested in when Jesus is coming, if you want to know if that's soon, you're going to have to look at what the prophets say. And this prophet we're going to look at in these two weeks is Ezekiel. Get your Bible. Ezekiel. Open it to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be looking at Ezekiel maybe like you never looked at the book of Ezekiel before. And that book is one of the Old Testament prophets 
particularly one that talks about this time that tabernacles uh, foretells the Feast of Tabernacles foretells. Should we get ready? We should get ready. Should we be ready? We should be should ready. We stay ready. This prophet that we're going to study, he talks about an alliance uh, between so, uh, Russia and Iran, for instance. And they're, they're allies now. And it never happened. That was 2,600 years ago, 2,500 years ago. Have they ever been allies before? Not before the 70s. That's awesome. So what Ezekiel prophesied wow. is coming to pass. Wow. So we're going to look at that prophet Ezekiel. In fact, we're going to look at prophets and prophecy um, itself. What a, what, a, what a wonderful thing it is. You know, Gloria, sometimes I think God could have been any way he wanted it to be. Yep. He could have been unapproachable. But no, he lets us work with him in prayer. He could have... Um, He's a father. Every day could just be a surprise what's going to happen. But no, he wrote it down in a book. And he said that's the litmus way test. Way ahead of time. Way ahead of time. The end, he told, from the beginning. Yes, he did. And he said, that's what makes me God, that I can tell you the end mm -hmm. from the beginning. Those who claim to tell you, th nobody else can make that claim, only he can. Right. So now we're going to see when we get to the middle part of Ezekiel, we're going to see prophetic words about nations that are in the news right now. But uh, first we're going to look at prophecy and its place. Uh, go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 1. And of course, you know, Paul is writing what the Holy Ghost gives him to write. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. This book is the oracles of God. This book, two thirds of it is prophecy. Much of it has already come to pass. But we're going to be looking at some that's come to pass in the book of Ezekiel and some that is coming, going to come to pass. The oracles of God. God gave oracles. He gave words uh, down through men, down through people. And, that, and those we call the oracles of God. That's the chief thing. This book right here is the oracles of God and all of it came through Jewish uh, scribes, Jewish hands. Maybe Luke... Uh, you know, what he wrote, but everything else came through someone who was born a Jew. I'm glad I'm a word person. I'm a word person. And we appreciate the oracles of God. Yes, we do. Now, uh, the link in the Jewish oral law, which is the Talmud, you know, when Moses was up there receiving the Torah from God and five books were written down, um, he also got an oral he was taught things orally. He was three times up that mountain. And he was taught things orally in all those days, which he gave orally to Joshua. And then Joshua gives them orally to the next one. For instance, the Jews are told, don't eat blood. Well, how do you not eat blood? You're going to slaughter animals. You know, there'll be a little blood in the meat. So he was given a process when he was in heaven by which to kill the animal, bleed it out, and you don't get any blood in the meat. And it's very intricate how you do it. It's called ritual slaughtering. Well, I'm glad they didn't put that in the Bible and I have to read through that when I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. But it was told by Moses. He told it to Joshua. They told it to the ones who did the ritual slaughtering. So there are things that are in the oral law um, and um, this is what it says about prophecy. The link between the Creator and His creatures by means of prophecy is one of the foundations of the creation of the world. In other words, Moses was told that one of the foundations in the creation of the world was that God, the Creator, is going to communicate with the people. Hallelujah! Praise and God. it is a foundational truth that He communicates with us. Now, He communicated with through prophets. And uh, twice as many prophets arose among the Jews as there were Israelites who left Egypt. That's two, an amazing story. Two million left Egypt. Wow. So that means they had four million prophets. Now just think about it. When they left Egypt, um, they had these prophets who, who daily, you know, they went to and they prophesied what they should do and you went to them for direction because you didn't have your own little copy of the Bible at the house. And you didn't have the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you. Only the prophet, the priest, and the king. Yeah. 
So the prophets would prophesy. Now, this is also from the oral law. Only such prophecy that was needed for later generations was written down. Well. Of these millions of Jews, the prophecies of only 48 men and seven women have been recorded in, <coughs> excuse me, in the scriptures. Of these 55 people, in many cases, it's just a sentence or two what they prophesied. But, praise the Lord, hmm. we have... Um, we have it now in the, in the Bible. The, the Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh. T stands for Torah. That's the first five books. N stands for the Nevi'im, the prophets. Eventually they were written down. And K stands for Kotvim, the writings. Uh, like, for instance, um, David put together all the Psalms. Some of them are from Moses. And David put them together in, mm. into the book. Now, the prophets... Um, God tells us in the New Testament in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now here's something really interesting. The last prophets in the Old Testament are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And they knew that there were going to be no further prophecies until Elijah would come who would, who would say that the Messiah has come. Remember the end of Malachi, it says Elijah will come. Mm. So then there's, pro, there's a wide space there of no prophecies. So the men of the great assembly, the Sanhedrin, then they canonized the Bible and they put the prophets all together in there and, mm. and, and made the canon, canon of the scriptures. Peter in the New Testament reveals how prophetic scripture came and he calls New Testament believers to take heed to the Old Testament prophets. Because when Peter's walking on the earth, there is no Bible except what we call the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Kotvim, the writings. We call it the Old Testament. That's the only Bible they've got. So Peter tells those followers, if you want to know where Je when Jesus comes, you check the Old Testament prophets. So Peter in 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, he describes that he had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration and they heard a voice from heaven declare that this is the Son of God and to listen to him. But Peter said, we have something more sure than that. We saw a vision. We heard a voice. But we got something more sure. We've got the word written down. Verse 19, we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in your hearts knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of uh, man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So he tells us that in the... Second Peter is actually a prophetic verse. The whole thing is prophetic about Jesus coming. Um, and he says, when you want to understand these things, you've got this word, the Old Testament prophets. And if you'll pay attention to what they say, it will be like a light shining in a dark place. It's pretty dark right now in this world. But if we want to know what happens with Iran, if we want to know what happens with um, Egypt, Iraq, Babylon... What prophet tells us? Ezekiel. And so we're going to be looking there for, for a light we'll shining in a dark place. Bless the Lord. Now, to understand prophecy, you have to give Israel a place in your thinking. Because Israel is the prophetic, Israel has the prophetic anointing upon them. Remember we started with this verse, what advantage then hath the Jew mm -hmm. or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. They got the prophecies that we're going to go by right now. Psalm 105, the whole Psalm 105 is about God's dealing with Israel. And in Psalm 105, 14, that'll be on page three of your notes, Glow. On, on Psalm 105, 14, it is written, he suffered no man to do them wrong. 
Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Now what it's talking about there is when he first, when Israel was just a young little nation, actually it was just Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. And remember, Sarah came over to Avimelech, we say Abimelech, and, um, and, uh, and Abraham said, tell them you're my sister or else they're going to kill me or something. So she's over there in Avimelech, Abimelech. He could make her in his harem if he wanted, but God warns him, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. It also happened with Rebecca in Genesis 26, 11. So it's only the matriarchs and patriarchs. It's just Abraham and Sarah. But the nation was in Sarah's womb. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be the mother. Abraham's the father. She's going to be the mother of the nation of Israel. And that is the nation that has prophecy on it. When Jesus' disciples ask him, when are you coming? When are you going to set up your kingdom on the earth? He said, watch the fig tree. The fig tree is Israel because that's the prophetic nation. It was a prophetic nation. Then it's the prophetic nation. Now, my daughter, Brenda, because, you know, we're talking about blood moons. We're talking about the calendar. She said, Mother, I grew up in Sunday school. I never once heard in Sunday school that there was a connection between Passover and Easter. And there's a great mm -hmm. connection. Easter is a fulfillment of Passover. So if you want to be in the know, you cannot ignore Israel and you cannot ignore God's calendar. God has chosen that his holy written word be more than one half prophecy. Some say two thirds. Most has been fulfilled. God's litmus test for being God is telling the end from the beginning. He said, I'm, and this is, I'm not going to turn to it, but it's Isaiah 41. You can read that chapter. And he says, who are you over here that are bringing forth these false notions? You see if you can tell us the end. If you can tell us the end, then we'll know you're God. But you can't do it. I'm the only one that can tell you the end from the beginning. So the litmus test for being God is prophecy. He is mm -hmm. God. Just think of it, glow. Uh, those things that have, we've already seen much of this prophecy come to pass. So we know that he is God. The Messiah did come. God's design, right. by his design, the Jews, Israel, and his fulfilled prophecies concerning that prophetic nation are the witnesses that he is God. We're going to be looking more that he, 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 he is the one who, who scattered them. And then he promised, I'm going to regather them. And that nation, that nation of Israel is the witness that God is God. You cannot ignore Israel. You are foolish to be anti-Semitic. I'm going to read to you here from Isaiah, another prophet. And Isaiah prophesied around the same time as um, a little earlier, but a little longer than um, Ezekiel. We're going to look at a chart of these prophets. But Isaiah 43, 1 through 12. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. He's talking about the Jews. When he talks about the physical uh, nation of Israel, he calls them Jacob. He doesn't call them Abraham, Ham. Abraham had other sons. He doesn't call them Isaac. Isaac had another son. He calls them Jacob when he's talking about the physical uh, uh, people, the Jews. All 12 sons of Jacob became the Jewish nation. So Isaiah 43, 1. But now thus saith Jehovah that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Then he says, when you, you walk through the water, when you walk through the flood, I'll be with you. Isaiah 43, 5, fear not, I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him... Israel, the Jews, Jacob, for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. There are people in this earth, they got eyes, but they don't see. They got ears, but they don't hear. Who are they? They're the nations. We're going to be looking at this group of people. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. 
Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, this is the truth. Now to Jacob, he says, to Jews, to Israel, you are my witnesses, saith Jehovah. You are my witnesses. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. I, even I, am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved. I have shown when there was no strange God among you. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Praise God. I'm going to read to you. Now, once Queen Victoria said to Disraeli, who was her Jewish prime minister, give me succinctly proof that there is God. He said, the Jew. They are the proof that there is God. He said in Isaiah 44, 7, And who, as I shall call and declare it and set in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, the ancient people are the Jews, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto thee. Israel is manifesting God unto us. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from that time and have declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no God. I say not. There is no God but God and His witness to the whole world. Right now they don't see it. They fight about it. They don't want to let Israel have Jerusalem. They're the witness to them that He's God. Praise God. Wow. That's good, Billy. That's exciting, isn't it? We're speaking about things to come. Sister Amen. Billy Brim is with us and she knows some things from the Bible that are going to happen. Yes. And it'll be a, it, there might, it's not a might happen, it's going to happen because it's written up that way in the scripture. It is written. It is written. It Thank is God so for the written word of God. And we're going to like it. The church is going to like it. Oh totally. man, it if comes born out again, right. Oh, this is good news. If you're not born again, you better move on and get born again because Jesus is coming. You know, uh, Chip, my son, is a came out of the sports world and our family's very avid about sports. Oh, I know. You know. And uh, he and Shelly were watching a game that they'd missed because they were on a preaching deal. So they had recorded it, you know. And it was a game where our team won at the last second. And they're just watching that game and they're so relaxed. And they said, Chip looked over at Shelly and said, do you realize if we didn't know how this came out, we would be nervous right now? So, you know, we get so involved in it. We would die do that. Look, you know, we know how it comes out. We're not nervous. No, we're not nervous. And one of the reasons we're not nervous is prophet Ezekiel. God, God. we're going to study him all through this week and you be sure to get your Bibles out. Amen. And uh, we know what's going to happen uh, with the countries of the Middle East. It's not like we were walking in the dark. No, we we're are in the, in the light. And that's exactly what Peter said. He said, uh, these Old Testament prophets are a light shining in a dark place Amen. and you give heed to them. Praise so God. it's it's if you want to know what's happening, you can't skip the Old Testament so prophets. So we're admonished to give heed. We're to admonished them. to give heed to them. You're right, Glow. You're admonished to. And Jesus admonished us, watch the fig tree. And the fig tree, of course, is the prophetic uh, nation. Gloria, I just finished doing a book called um, How You Can Pray in the End of Days and My Call to Help the Prayers. And the first part of it is biographical. And it has in there when we went up to Kenneth Hagin's. Uh, we hardly ever have any television shows that we don't talk about this because it was the beginning for us oh, in 1967. Yeah. When we went to 1029 changed North Utica, changed our it? lives. <laughs> and I, one week I was telling people that speaking in tongues was of the devil and the next week I was speaking in them. So everything changed there. Yep. And Brother Hagin became our mentor. He became a father in the faith to us. He did. And um, in uh, 1970, I went to work for Brother Hagen. 1967, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, started, you know, coming into contact with his teachings. But it was 1970 that I went to work for him and really got uh, sitting at his feet doing. It was my job. God told him, you put all your lessons into print. And it was my job to help him do that. Boy, oh, what a, brother, what a job. What a great job. Mm -hmm. So what I would do, I was the editor of publications and we had a monthly magazine called The Word of Faith. Yes. And then we had monthly lessons at that time. Two lessons we sent out every month and then we made books. 
And I was the editor of all of those, and I was a wife and a mother. You were busy. I was busy, and I think about how did I do it? Because we went to all the ball games. Shelly was always in concerts. We went to everything. And I know it's the grace of God. And you enjoyed every I minute enjoyed of it. I enjoyed every minute of it. And God graces you for yeah. whatever period of life you're in, whatever you have to do. And so the way I worked it out, you know, um, practicality of it, I would come home from work. The kids were out practicing some sport or band or whatever. Kent was working. And when I got home from work a little before all of them, uh, they're going to converge on me. And when they converge, they're hungry. So um, I would always do it this way. I would get Brother Hagin's teachings from Rhema. They were on cassette and I had a, a shelf over my sink and I would put that little tape recorder. I bet you had one that was about that size, you know, as a cassette recorder. And yeah. You punch play. I put the clothes to the left in the uh, washing machine and then I'm peeling potatoes. Every night I'm peeling potatoes. Shelly says she can still see my hands peeling potatoes. And I would punch play and listen to what he taught at Raymond to see if I can get something for publication. And this day, I remember putting that up there and Brother Hagen said to the Raymond students, today I'm going to teach you on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Hmm. Do you know why what that. Paul said on the subject in 1 Corinthians does not match what Jesus said in the Gospels? Did Brother Hagen say that? Yes. I thought, what? <laughs> you mean to tell me Paul didn't agree with Jesus? Of course, he asked it as a question. Nobody, none of the Raymond students knew it. I didn't know it. You thought for sure Paul and Jesus would agree. And then Brother Hagin said, no. It's because they were writing to two different groups of peoples. Jesus was talking to Jews living under the Old Covenant, and he was giving them the Old Covenant law of divorce. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 7, mm -hmm. is writing to the church, the new creation, the body of Christ, who has only one law, and that's the law of love. And he was interpreting different situations in the light of the law of love. And so you know how that is in these days. I've seen women that had to leave because they were abusive. The husband's beating them to death or the children, you know. So love would demand that you took the children out of that situation. So you, you interpret everything in the light of the law of love. That's so good. I'm listening to uh, Brother Hagen talk about this. And he says, now, uh, he read 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And on that tape, he said to the Raymond students, the Bible is the word of truth. But it has to be divided. It has to be rightly divided. If it can be rightly divided, it can be wrongly mm. divided. And he said, error, all error, and of course he's talking about people who preach error, is coming from a wrong division of the Word of God. So at that time to be in Rhema, you had to be a uh, thinking of going into the ministry. Now you can go if you're a Bible student, but then you had to be going into the ministry. So he said to them, it is required of you that you study to be approved unto God as a minister. You have a stewardship that you're going to answer for. And you study so that you rightly divide the word of truth. You don't wrongly divide it. Now he said, uh, in order to rightly divide the word of truth, he gave, he gave some um, rules that I've written down here on page three glow. He said, read the scripture in context. You don't just lift out a verse and build mm -hmm. a doctrine on it. You could lift out a verse and you can make the Bible say almost anything you want it to say. Brother Hagin said, uh, some people only know enough Bible to support their uh, meanness. <laughs> and he talked about one time going out into the mountains where these mountain people were and this man just terribly abused his wife. And he said, well, doesn't it say that the woman has to submit? You know, so she got to submit to his beatings. Uh, no, the scripture has to uh, be in context, walk in love. <laughs> you know, you don't uh, take it out of context. So rule number one, read the scripture in its context. Mm -hmm. Rule two, be sure it harmonizes with all God's word on that subject, on the That's matter. That's good. Be sure that this scripture you're reading here, it's got to harmonize with the whole revealed word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Rule number three, 
These are rules of Bible interpretation and rightly dividing the word. Rule number three, know who is speaking. Who's doing this speaking? If it's some evil, wicked king in the Old Testament, or you, you don't have to obey that, you know. Know to whom a scripture is speaking. It can be spoken to an individual, like Jesus said to Judas, mm -hmm. certain things. Well, you don't have to obey that. Know who is doing the speaking. I really like to use for this one, Job. You remember Job, he had those three so-called comforters? And much of the book of Job is what they said. And at the end of the book of Job, you find out from God that they were saying the wrong things and Job had to pray for them to be forgiven. So you cannot build a doctrine on what Job's comforter said. But I've heard three sermons in my lifetime on what Job's comforter said. Three too many. <laughs> and three too many. One of them was kind of a good idea, but get it from somebody else saying it. Don't get it from one of Job's comforters if you're going to preach it. Now, others were horrid. I remember sitting there during one of those sermons. I was listening to that guy and I thought, I wanted to scream. I wanted to say, the guy got in trouble for saying it. Don't preach it to me that I have to live under it. Job had to get forgiveness for him for saying that. So to do rightly divide the word, who's doing the talking? Yeah, yeah. And to whom is the scripture speaking? Can be speaking to an individual. It can be speaking to a group. Now, Brother Hagin here is talking about Jesus speaking to the um, Jews living under the old covenant. The law, the Mosaic law. He's talking about the Mosaic law. So, but Paul, he's talking about the Jesus law that he left. I'm giving you a new law. Love one another as I have loved you. John chapter 13. So, Brother Hagin then said, you need to know there are, a scripture can be speaking to an individual. It can be speaking to a group. Right. And there are three groups of peoples to whom or about whom a scripture can be speaking. They are the Jews, the nations, and the church. Brother Hagin read to us that day, and I'll read it to you right now, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 31 and 32. Whether therefore, writing to, the, writing to the church, all the Bible is for the church, but not all the Bible is about the church. The part of the Bible that's about the church is the New Testament letters. And in one of those letters, which is to us, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Jesus said, uh, Paul wrote, the Holy Ghost said, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none or no one offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Three groups of people. The Jews. Uh, it says here in 1 Corinthians 10, the Gentiles. You, you, if you have a newer translation, it's going to say Greeks. That's because the whole Gentile world had been Hellenized. It had been Greekalized. So sometimes in the New Testament, rather than saying the Gentiles or the nations, it says the Greeks. So there are three groups, the Jews, the Gentiles, that's a good way to say it, the nations, nor the church of God. As he was expounding on this scripture, Kenneth E. Hagin, I'm there in the kitchen. I've forgotten all about the potatoes. I'm, I'm not even peeling them anymore. I'm just listening to what he says. I've never heard anything like this in my life. And as I'm listening to him, I hear a voice. To me, it sounded audible. I don't know if you'd have been there, if you'd heard it or not. But here's how it sounded. I remember the inflection of the voice. If you will remember that verse of Scripture, hmm. it will keep your end time doctrine straight. Praise God. That verse, three groups of people, Jews, nations, church. I didn't even know I needed an end time doctrine. I just needed to get the word of faith out, get the clothes clean, get the food on the table. But throughout my whole life now, he has caused me to be particularly involved as a witness of the end times. 
what's happening in the last of days. And so for me to understand that, I've got to rightly divide the word because that's the only place that gives us the true picture of what's happening in the end days. So I have to know how to look in a scripture and to see, is this talking to the Jews? Is this talking to the church? Is this talking? And error. So many people are in error about the rapture. You know why? They look at scriptures that have to do with Israel and the Jews and they try to apply it to the church. If you're going to know about the rapture of the church, Mm -hmm. you're going to have to go into the New Testament letters. That's right. You're going to have to go into Thessalonians and other places. So because they don't rightly divide the word, then they've got things all mixed up for the last days and for the end times. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to know who these three groups of people are. Here's your next little set of notes. Bless the Lord. In the order of their appearance that they are given in the Bible... Uh, they are they are given to us in the order of first the nations and then Israel. We know that God created the earth and we know that man fell. Uh, we know that in Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4, it had become so evil that God had to um, judge the earth. And the flood judged it. Love brought that flood. If it had gone on much longer with evil, Noah's sons, I can tell you right now, they would have fallen. They, there's only one man left on earth with knowledge of God. Wow. Noah. That's cutting it to That's the bone. That's cutting it to the bone. Mm. And so love brought the flood. Genesis That's 6, 1 through 4. Yeah. Love, Gloria. That is awesome. Without judgment, people are, get so upset about judgment. Judgment takes out the evil. That's right. Bless the Lord. Thank God for it. And it's up to us to be on the right side. Just be on the right side where you don't have to know that judgment and you can take the judgment Jesus got for you. Bless the Lord. Amen. So when they got off that uh, boat, let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 10. And this explains to us where the nations come from. The first group that's introduced in the Bible are the nations. The 70 nations, Genesis chapter 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. We are putting up for you a table of nations, a chart of these nations, which gives us 70 nations. It begins with the sons of Japheth. And we have Gomer and Magog and Madai, and Madai is um, the Medes, Yavan, the, uh, the Greeks, Tubal, Meshach, Tiras. We're going to read some more about these. But it's, it gives all the sons of Japheth. And then it said, verse 5, by these were the isles of the Gentiles, nations is the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is goyim, and it means nations. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. So the first time we ever hear the word nations, the first time we ever hear of Gentiles are when those three sons of uh, Noah got off that boat. And so then from the chart of nations that we showed you, we have all the nations uh, given to us. There are 70 nations. Uh, The Jews sacrificed 70 bulls for the nations at Mm. the Feast of Tabernacle. And so we have the lines given to us of Japheth and Ham and Shem. And um, all the nations that came from them are given to us. Now we're going to find out that the nations rebel against God and against God's will. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1 tells us what God's will was. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's the divine plan. Now, the nations rebelled. They didn't obey God. What did they do? Genesis chapter 11. The whole earth was of one language and one speech, and it, after, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east... They found a plain in Shinar. Shinar is the same as Babylon, and they dwelt there. 
They just stayed there. They didn't do what God said. They didn't go throughout all the earth. Why did they not go out throughout all the earth? There was a rebellion against the will of God and it was led by a man named Nimrod. We're going to see him over in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Jehovah, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Jehovah. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, and the son, land of Shinar, out of the land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. I'm taking this from uh, the notes of uh, the art scrolls in the stone edition of the Chumash. Before Nimrod, there were neither wars nor reigning monarchs. He subjugated the Babylonians until they crowned him, verse 10. After which he went to Assyria and built great cities. The Torah calls him a mighty hunter, which Rashi and other commentators, commentators interpret figuratively. Nimrod ensnared men with his words and incited them to rebel against God. His first conquest, which laid the basis for his subsequent empire building, was Babel, which became the center of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire. It was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. Hmm. And then from there, he went to Nineveh. God came down. They didn't go throughout all the earth like God said. Nimrod, they, he wasn't supposed to be a king. He was supposed to have a kingdom. He was ensnaring men and hunting them to go against God. And then we find that God came down and judged them because Nimrod said, let us, verse four, go to, let us build for us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heavens. We're going to build it high enough that a flood can't get us. And let us make for ourselves a name. Lest, let us make, yeah, let for, us us make for ourselves a name. Lest we be scattered throughout all the earth. God told them to be scattered throughout the earth. But they didn't obey it. So God came down and he said, the people is one, verse six. The language is one. And this they begin to do. Nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. As long as they have one language and they can agree and speak the same thing, God said nothing will be restrained to them. So how do I stop it? Other, it, it as long as they didn't have one language, it was confusion. Yeah. If they don't have one language, Babel. they can't speak the same thing. Yeah. So he confuses their language. It becomes Babel, Babylon. And this is the beginning of the Babylonian system. They got off that boat. They're the sons of Noah. God bless them. Obey me and no blessing and no increase. Satan working down through Nimrod tempts them to rebel against God. So what does God do about it? That's the first group of people. Now we're going to look at the second group tomorrow. Okay. That's, isn't that awesome? Eventually we're going to get over to the book of Ezekiel because we are told... Um, that the prophets, the Old Testament prophets are a light in a dark place. It's dark in the world right now, but we know what's going to happen because we got the light of the Old Testament prophets. And Moses was a prophet who wrote the Torah. And so we're going to be reading about that today. God has a plan. This book is a plan. How it starts in Genesis, reveals right on through the book of Revelation. And from the beginning, God started with um, Adam. And you know that story. And then uh, you know how Adam fell, how the earth became so wicked. The Bible that, says God, the Amplified, I think, says God is extraordinarily patient. Is well, you can see truth? that in these pages of the book. My goodness. And you think about it, Gloria. It got right down in Genesis chapter 6 where there was nobody on this earth righteous but one man. Only one man had knowledge of God. So God had brought judgment to the earth. Love brought judgment. He provided that man a safety in the ark. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Oh they got off the boat. Now we know from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, there are three groups of peoples to whom scriptures are written and about whom scriptures are written. The first, the Jews, and then the nations, and then the church, 
That's what it says in, um, that's the order in 1 Corinthians 10. Now the Old Testament, there's only two groups, the Jews and the nations. In the New Testament, according to the second chapter of Ephesians, out of those two, the Jews and the nations, the Jews and the Gentiles, he made one new man. Any Jew, any Gentile can believe in his heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, accept him as Lord, oh, then he becomes a new creation. And the new creation man is a, a species that never existed before. There's also a new creation body, the body of Christ called the church. But in the Old Testament, we only see two. And the first one introduced to us is the nations. They got off the boat, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah. God told them to scatter throughout the earth. They didn't do it. Uh, a man, Satan entered a man named Nimrod. Nimrod built himself up a kingdom, said, you don't have to listen to God, just listen to me. Mother told me I had a little sister, three and a half years younger than me, and or three years younger. And mother said she heard me out there one day saying to Pat, you don't have to obey mother, just listen to me. Just do what I say. Well, that was not right. That's what the devil That's did. That's what the devil did. You don't have to listen to God. You don't have to go spreading out on all the earth. You just listen to Nimrod and you get yourself a kingdom and you go down there to the plains of Shinar, which is Babylon, and build yourself a tower. We'll be somebody. Really high. We'll make a name for ourselves. And, and if there is another flood, we'll be so high we won't get caught in it. So uh, God heard them and he said, since they all speak the same language, think of the power of words. Nothing will be restrained from them. So he went down and he confused them. And uh, this is the way the Arts Girls translates verse 9. He confused their language. They were already confused. They were already confused. You're right. You're right, Glow. Good. Touche. <laughs> and um, he said, that, this is what it says in verse 9 as the Jews translated it in the Arts Girls. That is why it was called Babel because it was there that Hashem scattered them over the face of the whole earth. He had told them to do it, they didn't do it, so now he scatters them. Now, they, they're, they're goners, unless there's a plan, but thank God he had a plan, mm -hmm. and he didn't have to think it up. He wasn't shocked by what they did, he knew what they do beforehand. So here is his plan, Genesis chapter 12. Now Jehovah had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. I don't have it down on there, Glow. I'm just, well, maybe I do. Get thee out of thy country. Yes, I do. And from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Get out of here. Is what yes. He told him. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The whole blessed. future of the earth was wrapped up in Abraham doing this simple thing God told him to do. Get and, out of town. And what do they call him? The father of faith. Yes. Faith hears God. He did it. God's word and acts on it. That's the way our life is too. Yes. Just do what he says and you'll, you'll have... You'll be delivered. You'll get out from under the curse. That's You'll where the blessed. blessing lies yeah. in, in obeying God. Oh. And he said, now I'm going to separate you from all the nations of the earth. Let's pretend that here we have, wouldn't you say these are blackberries? Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, pretend down here that that's a blackberry. And these are all the 70 nations and they're filled. So God separates out from them that kind of messed up here, but I'll use a more firmer one, raspberry. And God separates from all those nations a nation unto himself. It's a nation. Mm -hmm. It's his separated nation. The Jews are God's portion among the nations. The church, we're from every nation tongue. But from the nations, he separated a nation unto himself. He separated one nation and that nation's his. He's going to use it. What's he going to do with this nation? This nation has a call on it. This nation is to reveal to all those nations God. These right here, they have no knowledge of God. But he's going to reveal himself to these nations because one man, the father of these nations, followed him, 
got out of that country and went to a promised land. You obey me Mm -hmm. and I'm going to give you a land that's your land. So God's call upon Israel is to reveal uh, them. They will reveal God to the nations. He has a plan A. And for plan A, we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. He places them. We could read more about this in Deuteronomy 20, 32. We're not going to turn there. But he places them in the center of the earth. And he places them. We have an ancient map here to show you of um, kind of like a three-leaf clover. Mm-hmm. And the top leaf, one of this is uh, Jerusalem's at the center of this map. And then we have the uh, leaf at the top left, which is Europe, the leaf at the top right, which is Asia, and the leaf at the bottom, which is Africa. So right in the center of that is Jerusalem. He places Israel Mm -hmm. on a land bridge that goes between these three continents. It's the easy way to go. It's the Wea Maris, the way of the sea. So the best way to travel between those continents down to Africa for caravans, trade caravans, or even for armies is to go right through where God placed the Jews. And he placed the Jews there so they would be seen. And he placed upon Israel in that central location blessings. Mm -hmm. Let's read those blessings from Deuteronomy chapter 28. And it shall come to pass if you hearken diligently unto the voice of Jehovah your God to observe and do his commandments, which I command thee this day. Jehovah your God will set you on high above all what? Nations. All these nations. Yeah. You're going to be high over all those goyim, those 70 nations. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. If. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body. That's your children. Mm -hmm. And the fruit of your ground, your crops, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your kind, the flocks of your sheep. Now, I want you to notice as we're reading along on these blessings, every one of these can be seen. It's not spiritual blessings here. They came from the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But there's something that can be seen. Because here you are, you're on this land bridge, all these nations are going to pass through you and see you. So they got, they, you got to have something on you they can see. So what can they see? Your prosperity. Blessing. Your health. Verse 5. Blessed shall you be your basket and your store. He's even going to bless your, your storing it up. Your bank account. You see what store is? Dough. Yeah, dough. <laughs> bless did you think your, that up or did you get no, that from someone else? No, it's in the margin else? of my Bible. I mean, it's in here in the, you know, they did it in this Bible. Yeah. Hey, girl. Is that good You are so what? sharp today. Woo. That's two for you. I like that. Bless the Lord. I'm going to use that glow. No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> did you just now just think of that? No kidding. No, it's in the margin. I've, I've got it right All here. All right. Bless the Lord. Well, of course, that's Bless. their dough, but then mm-hmm. the, the relationship to money. Bless shall you be when you come in and bless shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall call your enemies, cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way and they're going to flee from you seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in your storehouses. He's blessing my bank account right now. Amen. And in all that you set your hand unto, he shall bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Jehovah shall establish you and holy people unto himself. Israel was the nation that's his. This nation, not for anybody else's use, this is just for God's. It's holy. That's what holy means, separated. And uh, verse 9, the Lord shall establish you and holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto you, if you shall keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, to walk in his ways. Now here's the part. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Jehovah and they shall be afraid of you. How shall they see it? 
a blessing. They're going to be, mar this is a blessing, and they're going to be marching down through the Wea Maris. They're going to be coming down through that easy way to travel along that Mediterranean shore, right where they are, and they're going to see, they're worshiping lots of gods. They're, they're back in their heathen countries. They're going to come through, it's God's plan, they're going to come through this nation, they're going to see you're wealthy, they're going to see your children are healthy. Their trees are green. Your fruit is big. And they're going to say, and they only hope worshiping one God. They're going to see this. Here's the line. They're coming down through here. Yeah. Now they get to here and they see the blessing. They see all the fruit. Yes. They see huge fruit. Yes. Well, they could hardly get things to grow over here because they were under the curse. That's right. But they see all this. They see it. Ooh. And then not, witness. those people are naturally going to think, because they're, they're not atheists. They don't, none of those pagan people are atheists. They're all worshiping some kind of a God, even if it's a demonic one. And they're going to attribute what you've got to your God. That's right. So they're going to say, these people, they only work worshiping one God. His name is Jehovah. And look and see what they Look got. and see the result of it. Yeah. That's God's plan. That's, That's God's right. plan. Witness. Jehovah shall, verse 9, Jehovah shall establish you and holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto you if you keep the commandments of the Lord and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Jehovah mm -hmm. and they shall be afraid of you. Something. And Jehovah shall make you plenteous in goods in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your cattle, in the fruit of your ground, in the land which Jehovah swore unto your fathers to give unto you. The Lord shall open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give its rain unto your land in its season. And he will bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend unto many nations. You shall not need to borrow. And the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail. And he shall, and you shall be above only and not beneath. Yeah, that's right. Listen how this translates uh, Hebrew. Which verse are you? Uh, this is going to be verse uh, 13, okay. where it says, You shall be above only and not beneath. Here is what it says in the Hebrew. You shall be in constant ascent. You shall never descend. Always increasing, in other words. Always increasing. That's always good. going up. Always constant ascent. Constant That's ascent. Good. I like and that. And you shall never descend if you hearken unto uh, the commandments of the Lord your God. Now, if you do this and you do not, verse 14, go after other gods to serve them, here's what you're going to have. That was plan A. God put them there. Joshua took the land. Uh, for a while, they, blessed, well, they were blessed in it. But then they started listening to the Canaanites. And the Canaanites said, okay, you got that God, God, God Jehovah. He worked for you before. But we got another God up here over the crops. His name's Baal. Or we, Baal. We say Baal. So we know that they did um, descend. It was not God's plan that they descend, oh, but they did. Now, God has got a plan B. Their job is still to reveal God to the nations. If you don't do it in plan A, me putting you there and letting the blessing show on you, I'm going to plan B. Hmm. Here's plan B. And you can, he, he gives you all the curses here. We don't want plan we B. We don't want the plan B. Verse 63 um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of curses in there, aren't there? Yes. I don't want to be in that. No, place. we don't, we're not under I'm that because be in the New Testament tells us this was given originally to Israel. It belongs to them, but there's a parallel giving of it to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Abrahamic blessings. Galatians. Yeah. Now, Deuteronomy 28, 63. It shall come to pass that as, as this is if you don't obey God that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, then you will be destroyed. You shall be plucked up from off the land where you went to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other. And that word scatter is where we get the word diaspora or diaspora. A spore is a seed. And he's just going to take you Jews, you, you Israel, if you don't obey him, and he's going to scatter you throughout all the earth. But then, because they are people with a knowledge of God, then wherever they go, it's going to grow up a knowledge of God. So um, 
let's read Deuteronomy chapter 4. I don't think I put it in the notes for you, Gloria, but it's Deuteronomy chapter 4. And Moses said that, um, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I have to see which verses I want here. Deuteronomy 4, 27 through 31. 27 through mm-hmm. 31. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4. I've got five. Before they ever went into the land, Moses told them, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be scattered because God knew they were going to fail. And in verse 27, Deuteronomy 4, 27, the Lord shall scatter you among the nations and you shall be left few in number among the nations. The, the word's not heathen, it's goyim, the nations. Wherever the Lord shall lead you. Verse 29, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you'll find him and you're going to return. And uh, when you are in tribulation, we know that that tribulation time is coming and you are going to return. And verse 31, he will not forsake thee nor destroy thee nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore unto them. For ask now of the Lord of the things that are past and they're going to come home and God is going to make them a great nation. All throughout the Old Testament, we see there is this scattering, but at the end of days, God is going to bring them home. And when he brings them home, we're living at the time when he brings them home. You see proof of that every time you go to Israel. Every time I go to Israel, they're back. And we're going to read what God said. We'll later on get through the prophecies that God gave, the dry bones prophecies. We're going we're gonna to read how God prophesied. They're going to come up out of that Holocaust Amen. and they're going to be a nation again. And so, yes, they were uh, witnesses of God when they were in the nation and the blessings of God that were on them. But now that they have been scattered, they're going to be regathered in the end of days. And when they are regathered in the end of days, then that means that uh, Jesus God's coming. coming. Yes, I, I, I want to show you a chart that we have of these days. God gave to Moses uh, a six-day work week, a thousand years being a day, a day being a thousand years. And we are at the end of the sixth day. We are about to go into the millennium, seventh day. And mm-hmm. so all the prophecies say that at the end of that sixth day, he's going to bring them home. Two of the chapters that you can read that are just absolutely wonderful uh, that tell you about him bringing them home is Jeremiah. Jeremiah 30 and and 31. And God particularly, I like one way he says it here. Hear ye, this is uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 10. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. You think about it, Gloria. Look at Israel over there right now. They were scattered. Then God called them home and we've seen them come home and they are surrounded with enemies. They are surrounded with enemies who daily say, we are going to push you to the sea. We are going to annihilate you. We're going to kill you all. We're going to destroy Zionism. What is Zionism? Zionism is you believe that God has promised the Jews to come back to Zion. And there they are, all surrounded. But God says, hear ye the word of the Lord, O ye nations. And before we finish with with, uh, uh, Ezekiel, we're going to be talking about nations. He prophesies about Egypt. He prophesies about uh, Iraq. Babylon. He prophesies about Russia and Iran, Turkey. And so listen up, everybody. Listen up, all those neighbors. He that scattered Israel will gather him. He's done it now Mm -hmm. and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Don't be concerned. They're not going to be wiped off the face of the earth with a nuclear blast. That's right. They will not. Glory to God. He keeps them. And it's a sign to the nations. That's their job. Reveal God to the nations. That's right. That he's God. And reveal the blessing to the nations. And reveal the blessing. Of course. Hallelujah. 
glory to God. Billy's just talking to us about the end time, the glory, exciting mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, Gloria, uh, some people say we live in dark times, but it says in Isaiah 61 that even when the world's in gross darkness, the glory can be seen. Amen. And um, there is, it, it says, Peter says, there's a light that can shine in the dark place. And the light that can shine for you in the dark place is the Old Testament prophets. They're the ones that God gave the word through what's going to happen. So we're looking at an Old Testament prophet who really, it's a long book. And it's a book that um, it, it's right up to date. It has prophecies about the nations that are all around Israel. And of course, Israel is at the center of all Bible prophecy because Jesus said, if you want to know what time it is, look at the time clock, look at the fig tree. Yeah. And so we're, we're studying Ezekiel and let's turn to the book. Uh, we're just going to go a little bit into it right here at the first. The book of the prophet Ezekiel or Yehezkiel, it means um, strength of God or strengthened by God. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river uh, Chebar, or Chibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw the visions of God. We've been studying that God said to the Jews, you're going to be my witness to the nations that I'm God. I'm going to reveal myself through you. Plan A, you get to live in the land and be blessed and all the traveling caravans will come down that easy road down there by the Mediterranean Sea where you join three continents together. They're going to see you blessed. They're going to see you healthy, prosperous. But if you don't obey me, mm. we're going to plan B. And plan B is we're going to scatter you to the ends of the earth. We don't want plan B. And then when I bring you back home, they're going to see that I'm God. Well, they didn't obey God and they got into gross idolatry and gross sin. He told them not to get in idolatry. Mm. Mm. And so uh, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, carried them off into captivity and Ezekiel was one of the ones that went with them into captivity. He is a priest. And um, there are three prophets of the time of the Babylonian captivity. We have a, have a chart to show you that. And you can kind of look on here and see Daniel is at the same time as Ezekiel. Jeremiah, these three uh, are of the same time period. Jeremiah went with the captives that went down into Egypt. Uh, but Daniel and Ezekiel are with the captives that were carried off by Nebuchadnezzar over into Babylon present-day Iraq, you might say. And so uh, he is among the captives. But even among the captives, Gloria, eventually their temple gets destroyed. They lose their land. They're in a terrible state. They think, is God through with us? Does he want anything more to do with us? So what a statement it is when Ezekiel is over with the captives, over in Babylon, over in present-day Iraq, and the heavens open up to him. Praise God. This shows God's not through with him. And God gives him visions. He has many visions throughout this book. Verse 2, And in the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Jehezkel, or Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there mm. upon him. The hand of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. There's only two times in this book that uh, his name is mentioned, because most of the time, God calls him Ben-Adam, or son of man. And so the, 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 the heavens are open to him. And the first vision that he sees, and I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. As you study judgment in the Old Testament, you'll see that whirlwind often has to do with judgment. A whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding upon itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, 
as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Hayot. Eve's name was Haya. It means life. These are the Hayot in Hebrew, living creatures. We see them again in the book of Revelation, the living creatures round about the throne. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined together one to another. Verse 9, they turned not when they went. Everyone went straight forward. So here we are with these living creatures. And, um, and verse they're all together. And they're yeah, they're this. all together. And they're, they're, they're actually with their wings and their faces, they're forming like a box. Each one looking out hmm. a different way. Now this box is for a reason. And their wings are there, their faces, they can go any way. Verse 15, now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like the color of a burl. They had one likeness and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So we always hear that old spiritual Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. So this, this box like creation is a chariot. It's a chariot and it's the Hebrew word mirkava. Mirkava is the word for chariot. It's used throughout the Bible, the chariots of God. And this is a mirkava. It's a chariot of God. Um, the Jews uh, have tanks, you know, army tanks, and they call them Mirkava. Hmm. Now, verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it, upon it. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness about it. So in this box-like chariot formed by these living creatures with their wings together, their faces outward, the wheels can go anywhere the spirit wants them to go, it's a throne of God. It's the, it's the chariot of God and it has a purpose. And this purpose I never knew until I got that, um, the book that we're offering this time, you know, uh, the book of Ezekiel is translated by the, by the Jews. And um, this chariot is sent here for a, a certain reason. And it is sent here to escort the glory. Hmm to escort the glory out of the temple. Mm. And uh, so that chariot is going to escort it and it's going to leave, the Shekinah is going to leave the temple. Mm. Now the glory. Ezekiel has to do with the nations, what's going to happen to them, the wars that are coming, but it goes right on up to the temple in the millennial time, which will be filled with the glory. Ezekiel is a book about the glory. Ezekiel was called to witness the glory leaving the temple and then when it will return. So the glory, the presence of God that can be seen is very, very important to all the whole plan of God. This earth under a curse is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Mm. But there is a certain manifestation of the glory called, we say, Shekinah. Mm -hmm. But in the Hebrew, is Shekinah. And it, 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 it manifested in the Bible like a cloud, like a fire. 
And if you will turn in your Bible to Romans 9, I put it here for you, Gloria. I printed it oh, out good. for us. Thank you. You're yep. so good to me. And um, I hope you have your Bibles there, you know, because we're studying the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to study now a little bit about the glory. So Paul, writing in the book of Romans, uh, speaks of the Jews. And he calls them his brethren, according to the flesh. And he says this, starting with verse 3. My brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, it's here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The adoption, each one of these is a separate thing. From the Jews, remember he's going to reveal to the nations himself through the Jews. So he revealed through them the adoption, the glory comes revealed through them. The covenants, more than one. The giving of the law, the word, the Torah the service of God, the ministry to God, the promises, whose are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one came, who is over all, God bless forever. So these are what came down through us, to us through God, revealing himself through the Jews. And number, the second thing he mentions is the glory. Mm-hmm. And he's talking here about the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah. So years ago, many years ago, God gave me a revelation of the glory. And it came, um, sometimes I would even see visions. And I did. I saw Adam, Adam in the garden. And... Um, I saw that every other creature had covering. Fish had scales. Yeah. Animals had fur. But Adam was, was covered with something else. And so in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, an angel says this to God. When I considered thy heavens, the work of thy fingers... He's been watching creation. We know this is an angel because Hebrews tells us it is. One angel said in a certain place and then quotes this. So an angel who watched God in creation said this. Psalm 8, 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? I've got a question here. He starts out bragging on God for creation and then he says, <clears throat> I do have a question. The angels had never seen such a thing. What is man, ben Adam, that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Angels always had to call on God. But here's one that God goes down to the garden and visits him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Really, that word in the Hebrew is Elohim. And Elohim is the plural of El. Im at the end of a word is plural. So Elohim mm -hmm. is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. You made him just a little lower than the Godhead. And they had always known God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and then the archangels and then angels. But here God puts someone between the archangels and the Godhead, and it's man. You made him just a little lower than Elohim, and you crowned him. God crowned the man. All creation was watching God said to me, I didn't do this in a corner. All creation was watching me when I walked out. I stepped out to the, to the center of the universe and I said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. And then God himself, he didn't ask Gabriel to do it. He didn't ask Michael to do it. God himself walks over to the man and crowns him. The crown isn't made with diamonds. It isn't made with gold. God paves streets with gold. It's made with glory. You crowned him with glory. Mm. Glory is the presence of God manifested. 
so you can see it. Every time glory is mentioned in the Bible in the Old Testament, you can see it. Comes like a cloud, comes like a fire, comes like a um, smoke. But you always can see it. You crowned him with glory and honor. Now, when I was seeing all this and God was showing me this about man and showing me about the glory, I saw, I had a vision one morning when I was getting ready to go to the Sunday school class and teach it. And I saw God, I didn't see his face, but like here, uh, uh, glory and, and man fell. I saw man fall. He fell from the highest heights to the lowest depths because Satan tempted him. And the Lord said to me, before I saw the fall, do you know Romans 3, 23? I wheeled around. I was fixing my face. I was glad it was one I knew. Yes. And I quoted to him, for all have sinned and come short of the <gasps> glory. And that's when I saw man, man fall. He was crowned with the glory, mm -hmm. but he fell from the glory. And I saw him with the lowest depths there. I saw him with Satan. I saw Satan say, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Because God had said he's going to have dominion over the works of God's hands. And Satan thinks he's one. Mm -hmm. He's divided man from the glory. I'm God. Yeah. And from God. And I just about fainted. Physically, I got weak. And the Lord, like a, like a ticker tape, a scripture came into me. Mm -hmm. And the voice of the Lord said to me, but the captain of your salvation is bringing many sons to glory. God. And that lifted me up. But I saw that God and man were, were divided. Satan thought it could not be fixed. Mm -hmm. He thought man could never Praise work with God. Praise the Lord. You and I know he sent the Lord of glory to be the captain of our salvation. Amen. But for a long, long time, the Lord said to me, I saw a picture. I saw my son there in that vision. Terry was a bull rider at that time. And I saw him there with a silver buckle around his little narrow waist. And God said, um, what if you couldn't hug Terry? For if you hugged Terry, you would destroy him. You would burn him up. And I thought, oh, I probably forget like King Midas, you know, in the golden touch. I'll probably forget and hug him. He said, that was my position with man. Mm -hmm. If I had classed the, the natural tendency of a man with a fallen child is to rescue that child. But if I had done so, my glory would have destroyed him. It would have eaten him up. It would have burned him alive and all mankind with him. Therefore, Satan would have won yeah. because he could have keep my word from coming to pass that I'm going to give man dominion over the works of my hands. And so he then is separated from mankind. And all for long years, he does not come into contact with man for man's preservation until, now what did our scripture tell us in, um, in Romans? What advantage is there to being a Jew? And he said, the glory. Hmm. So yeah. he's going to bring the glory back. He's going to bring it. He's, there is, there's going to come a re-entry of the glory and he's going to do it through his separated people, the Jews, who are call. The call for them is to reveal God to the nations. So re-entry of the glory. They've been separated for years. God and man. Re-entry of the glory. Moses. Moses is out on the side of the mountain in the wilderness, tending his father-in-law's sheep. And he noticed something. He notices a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. And he goes over to that bush and he hears the Lord say, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Mm -hmm. You see, not only was man have been destroyed, but earth was, it was in a curse. Mm -hmm. So God then has to carefully re-enter the glory. So he cleans a little of the earth off right there by that bush, mm -hmm. cleans it all so he doesn't destroy it. And he tells Moses, take your shoes off. And Moses comes up here and we have a re-entry of the glory. God tells Moses, you go back. I've got a plan. 
And his plan was, Gloria, he wanted to be close to man again. He wanted to be close to him. So through Moses, going back to his people who are, who are in um, Egypt, through Moses, he's going to call Moses and he's going to call that whole nation of Israel out to a mountain. And he's going to mm. have re-entry of the glory. Hallelujah. And so we're going to, he, he, he brings him, uh, let's, let's go to Exodus chapter uh, 24. Bless the Lord. And you know about all the 10 plagues and all of those things. We're just going to read this and tomorrow we're going to take up right here. You bring your Bible tomorrow. So he takes them out to the mountain and he has this elaborate plan for the Israelites. They can't come too close to that mountain. If even a, if an animal comes through, it's going to die because the glory will kill you if you're not. John G. Lake said, the glory of the Lord is as destructive of evil as it is mm -hmm. creative of good. And so Moses went up into the mount and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he went into Moses. He called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. What does the New Testament say? What advantage did the Jews have? It was through them that God brought back the glory. We're going to read about that, study on that tomorrow. Bring your Bible. And we'll look at how the book of Ezekiel That's awesome, is all tied into the glory. Billy, we're excited about this. Yes, we are. Bless the Lord. And we're studying the book of Ezekiel, uh, the prophet who gives us so much insight into oh, these days in which we live. Jesus. Now, one thing about the book of Ezekiel that many people don't know is it's very tied into the glory. Mm. Um, Ezekiel is the witness of the glory leaving the temple, and of it coming back, its return. Ooh, so hallelujah. we know that man was crowned with the glory. Mm -hmm. He fell from the glory. Mm -hmm. The glory of God is the presence of God manifest. Uh, Adam and Eve couldn't stand the glory of God. They hid themselves from the presence. They've been walking with them every after day. They sin. But after they sin, they can't walk, they can't do it. So um, God then is separated from man. He doesn't have any close contact with man for Many, many years. And then there is a re-entry of the glory into the earth. New Testament tells us what advantage is there to being a Jew. And God says that through them, he revealed the glory. And so re-entry started with Moses seeing that burning bush. Mm. And then uh, God calls them out to a mountain, Mount Sinai. And he gives them, oh, don't get too close, because if you get too close, the glory could destroy you. So they have to stand back a certain uh, um, a place. And then Moses, who's the only one that could possibly do it, he, he can go up into the presence of God because he's wow. been prepared for it. And he goes up into the mountain. And now God hasn't been close with his people for centuries. His presence, his glory hasn't been there. And in... Chapter 25, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Now, all, now he's had a, a closest with some people, but not like this. And the first time he meets with them, he says, Get me an offering. So what, what is he going to do with the offering? This is from Exodus 24, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them that I may sit among them. I want to get close to them. Then verse 22, there I will meet with them and I will commune with them from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Testimony. And I will give commandment unto the children of Israel. He says, Moses, I want to get close to them again. Mm. Well, you're going to have to go about this thing very carefully. You have to obey what rules I tell you how to do it. Take up an offering that they give willingly with their heart. Build me a tabernacle. And there, uh, there's going to be an ark of the testimony of the covenant. And over it are going to be two cherubs. 
And so cherubim is plural. Their, um, their wings are going to meet likeness of it. And then below it, that's the mercy seat. And there I'm going to meet with you. So Moses did it. And in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33, God gives him intricate. you got to obey this. You've got to do it just this way. I, I, and Moses saw the pattern in heaven. And so he builds it just the way God told him to build it, the tabernacle. Exodus 40, 33 says, So Moses finished the work. Hallelujah. In verse 34, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God moved in. They're building him a place to sit. So here we're going to have what's called the Shekinah, the Shekinah. It's the manifest presence of God. And he comes over that holy, over that uh, um, Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And there he can be seen like a pillar of cloud or like a fire. When the work was finished. When the work was finished, the glory moved in. Glory moved in. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon mm. and the glory of the Lord filled, filled Ooh, the tabernacle. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now they move on. They move on into the promised land. And there the Lord has told them there's a certain place where I want to put my name. Hamakom. David finds that place and Solomon builds there a dwelling place for the Shekinah, for the glory. He's going to do it according to the pattern. This time David was chose, uh, saw the pattern. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of Jehovah was finished. It was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. We're exactly in that time right now. Mm. It was, a, we are in Sukkot. Or actually, we will begin to be in it on Monday. On these dates, you're yeah, saying. Yeah, Monday, next Monday. And it's during this time, this seven-week feast of the tabernacles, that, Mo, that Solomon finished. And he gathers up all of Israel, all of them, millions of them. And they're on that temple mount. They're going to dedicate mm -hmm. the temple. 2 Chronicles 5.11 And it came to be passed, came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place for all of the priests were present that were present were sanctified. They did not then wait by course. They had courses. There's over 4,000 of them. They normally serve a while and then go home to their families. But yeah. now they're all there, 4,500 or so. Also the Levites, the singers, all of them, Asaph, Heman, Yedithan with their sons and their brethren, arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, that's hallelujah, hallelujah, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. When they reached this pitch of unity with the instruments and the sound, hallelujah, ki tov, ki leolam chasdo, then the house was filled with a cloud, hmm. even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand the minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of of the Lord Praise God. had filled oh, the house good? of God. Oh, and there gosh, over that temple, Jesus. on that temple mount, Mount Moriah, Dome of the Rock is there now, shouldn't be, will someday leave. But there on that mount was the temple, Solomon's temple. Oh, covered in gold. One of the wonders of the world shone. Bless the Lord. And Moses built, Moses built a tabernacle and the glory came in. Solomon built a temple and the glory came in. The presence of God rested in these abodes. The Shekinah, the Shekinah. The book of Ezekiel is about many things. Prophecies coming to pass all around us, a war that's coming. But it is as much about the glory of the Lord 
as it is mm. about anything else. The chariot of God comes from heaven to earth. And we talked about that yesterday with the living creatures. The chariot of God comes from heaven to earth to accompany the glory as it departs from the temple. The glory of the Lord has been there, but Israel has sinned. They had entered into gross sin, terrible sin. Gloria, if I told you some of the sins, and they're written there in the Word of God, they so disrespected God. Mm -hmm. Gloria, there was a time that the elders of Israel went into that house, that house of God, turned their backs on God, looked toward the sun, and passed wind toward God. Mm. It was terrible. My. And because they entered into this, this gross sin, then God is going to take the glory out. And He sends mm. the Mirkava. He sends the chariot of God to escort it out. If the glory had not been escorted out of the temple, Nebuchadnezzar could never have taken it. He could never have burned it. But when the glory oh. departs, it's just a building without Him, yeah. without yeah. the glory. But when the glory departs, the building is just an empty shell and then Israel is left uh, vulnerable. And, if and the, not, if the, gl the glory had not departed, they, they, they couldn't would have not have been down. conquered. They, they would not have, have been conquered. They're, they're, it was eventually burned mm -hmm. and destroyed, the first temple. It could not have happened. So we see back in um, Ezekiel, we're going to turn to Ezekiel, the first chapter, and we're not going to read again, but you be sure to do it. And you read about how this um, chariot was formed with these four living creatures and how their faces and how their wings formed like of a box. And then in the midst of it was one upon a throne and there was a wheel within a wheel was outside of the, of the chariot. And this, this chariot went every way the spirit wanted it to go. And it is here for the express purpose of escorting the glory out from the temple. Oh, mercy, mercy, mercy. I never knew this until I read that, um, uh, the book of Ezekiel that Art Scrolls does. I didn't really realize this. Normally just reading through, I think a Christian uh, without some enlightenment about the glory uh, would catch it. But look at Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 12. The glory departs and I'm quoting uh, Art Scrolls, in 10 agonizing stages. The Talmud describes it um, exactly. The Shekhinah slowly withdrew from the holy city and the holy temple, leaving them naked to the onslaught of Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian hordes. So reading, no defense. No defense. So reading here in... Um, uh, chapter 3 and verse 12 of Ezekiel. Then the Spirit took me up, and this is going to be in King James. And I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, Blessed be the glory of Jehovah from His place. Mm. That actually means exiting His place. You could read it like that. Mm. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of great rushing saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord as He departs from His place. The glory is departing. God's Word translation uh, translates it like, like this. Then the Spirit lifted me, and behind me I heard a loud thundering voice say, Blessed is Jehovah's glory which left this place. It's leaving. Hmm. Now let's go over to chapter 10. And we see here in the Bible some of the steps of its departure. Very interesting. Chapter 10, verse 1, Ezekiel, chapter 10, verse 1. Uh, I didn't put this in there, Gloria. We'll have to go to our chapter here in the book. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. 
And he spake unto the man clothed with women linen and said, Go in between the wheels. Remember, here's the chariot, yeah. and the wheels are around it. Go in between the wheels under the cherub and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And the city is Jerusalem. And he went in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. You know, then the glory of the Lord mm. went up from the cherub. Remember, it's there between the cherubim. Mm -hmm. It went up and it stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with a cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. It's leaving the Holy of Holies now and it's moving out into the court. Verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. Mm -hmm. End of verse 19. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them from above. The cherubim. Now let's go to verse chapter 11 and verse 22 and 23. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. It's come up now. It's come up from the Holy of Holies. It's gone out into the courtyard and it's, it's visible there in the city, but it, it's, it's going to leave the city. And it's going to go over the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. The mountain, which is on the east side of the city, is the Mount of Olives. So it goes over to the Mount of Olives and then from the Mount of Olives it's going to go up into heaven and there it's going to be. In the second temple, the Shekinah was never there. It left in the first temple time and it was never mm. there. In the second temple, it was not there. So the Shekinah, we see, this is sad. Yes. Very, very sad. The presence of God has left the temple. Only then could it be captured. Only then could it be destroyed. Yeah. And it goes out to the Mount of Olives. Now, think about this. Where did Jesus go up? Mount. From the Mount of Olives. Where is he coming back? To the Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. Now, look what's going to happen. Ezekiel was the witness of the glory leaving. He's going to be the witness of all things that transpire in the meantime, captivity, uh, nations, end times, wars. But then he's going to be the witness. God shows him in a vision of the glory coming back. And so let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 43. Mm -hmm. From Ezekiel chapter 40 on, it describes the millennial temple. Ezekiel 43. And Ezekiel 43, God describes during the millennium, folks, yes, the whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and the glory of the Lord. But in the millennium, that same Shekinah, that same manifestation that stood over the uh, temple of Solomon is going to come back. And it's going to be in the millennial temple. Ezekiel 43, and we're going to read verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Ooh, and the last chapter of the book of Ezekiel, after he describes the millennium and how the land's going to be divided among the tribes of Israel, then he's talking about the, uh, Jerusalem. And he said, it was around about, we're talking about uh, Jerusalem of the millennium, 18,000 measures and the name of the city from that day shall be Jehovah Shammah. In the millennium, mm. the name of the city shall be Jehovah Shammah. Oh, hallelujah. Jehovah is there. Bless the Lord. We also see in Zechariah, he's another prophet that tells about that time. Zechariah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. 
Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle that shall come there. For I, saith Jehovah, will be unto her a wall of fire mm. about her, and I will be the glory Praise in the midst God. of her. We're talking about the millennium. We're talking about the glory coming back. A wall of glory around Hallelujah. about and in the midst. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. In that day shall the branch of Jehovah be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, he that remains in Jerusalem, shall be called holy. We're talking about Jews upon the earth um, during, the, during the tribulation. And then they make it through, and they recognize the one whom they've pierced. Every one of them that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. There is a day coming. We're talking about the nation of Israel. There's a day coming when all of its filth, all of its sins will be forgiven. Mm. And when that day comes and they shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, then Jehovah will create upon every dwelling place on Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night for upon all the glory shall be a defense. Mm. Now, Praise the God. Amplified Bible says, and it ends for, um, and the Lord will create over the whole site, over every dwelling place on Mount Zion, a cloud uh, over her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming far by night for over all the glory shall be a hoopah, a canopy. God. So over Jerusalem, it shall be seen. Remember all the nations that make it through and are living upon the earth during that time? They still go by sight and they're ordered to come up to Jerusalem once a year for the Feast of Tabernacles. And when they get close, they're going to see this canopy of the glory. glory to God. They're going to see. And God's word translate, the Lord will wash away the filth of Zion's people. He will clean blood stains from Jerusalem with a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. Jehovah will create a cloud of smoke during the day and a glowing flame of fire during the night over the whole area of Mount Zion and over the assembly. His glory will cover everything. Praise God. And you know, we showed that on, that's going to be seen on the cover of the syllabus. His glory of that temple. So here's what the book of Ezekiel does. It tells us about the chariots that came to escort the glory out of the temple. Mm -hmm. All what happened in the meantime, but it's not over. The glory's coming back, even to the temple in Jerusalem. Right. And he's the witness of it. Oh, isn't that amazing? Glory to God. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us a glimpse. Yes, Lord. Something great and marvelous that's going to happen in the future. We worship you, Lord. There's no God like you. We thank you for all of the blessings and protection and all the good that you've done for us in all of our lives. We thank you that we've been delivered and we thank you that there's a glorious triumph in the end. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God wins. And God we wins. win because we're Hallelujah. With him. Hallelujah. Earth is headed for the glory. Yes, amen. Billy and I'll be right back. The Book of Ezekiel, an ancient book of prophecies, visions, and signs from thousands of years ago, now coming to pass before your eyes. The Book of Ezekiel study package will open your eyes to this ancient book, the Jewish prophet who penned it by God's Spirit, and the importance of its message to you today. Unlock the mysteries that the Bible says are to come. Dr. Billy Brim's study syllabus on the book of Ezekiel and Gehezkel, a new translation from the Hebrew commentary. Two strong resources for your in-depth Bible study. Bible prophecy like you have never seen before. Learn the glory of God that runs through the book of Ezekiel. Receive useful insight into the book of Ezekiel with the book of Ezekiel study package for only $39.99. Go to kcm.org slash TV special or when you call 800-600-7395. This is a time to be courageous. Understand the book of Ezekiel and how Israel, the nations, and the church fit into God's end time events. Equip yourself with the word and be ready for Jesus' return.
Gain important information about end time events with the Book of Ezekiel package for only $39.99. Log on to kcm.org slash TV special or call 800-600-7395. Jesus himself took care of you on the cross. You can leave all your past behind you. You can receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and become a new creation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with this new creation. Mm -hmm. He's right with God. No sin, no, no devilish stuff in you. And you can be born over again so that you can walk in the full plan that God has for you. He's got a plan for you. Even if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, there's good things prepared for you. So Billy and I want to lead you in prayer to make Jesus the Lord of your life. If you want to change, make a change. This is a real change. It's from, it's from death to life. It's from sickness to health. It's from poverty to abundance. It's a good plan. So just say this, Jesus. Jesus. I receive you. I receive you. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Take my life. Take my life. And do something with it. And do something with it. I come now to you. I come now to you. And I give you all the glory. And I give you all I'll the glory. I'll serve you. I'll serve you. All the days of my life. All the days of my In life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now just that simple prayer. Open the door for you to be born over again. You're changed on the inside. That old dead, mean nature's not there anymore. You get born over again. And then you get in the Word and you find out what belongs to you and you begin to live free. You have to, you have to get in the Word to see what all good things belong to you. It's an amazing package, hallelujah, that belongs to you. And we want to give you some information on that. It's called the Salvation Package. It's free. It's a book, two brochures. Learn who you are in Christ Jesus. Billy and I, can we are witnesses that everything changes when you put yourself in the Lord's hands. So write, uh, request your free package. Make Jesus the Lord of your life today. Don't go another day without being born again. And then read your Bible every day. Get in a good church that preaches the Word. And do what the Bible says, and mm -hmm. the blessing will blessing. be manifest in your life. Amen. Receive the Holy Spirit, listen to Him, obey Him. God's got a good future for you. Hallelujah. Today is offering day, and I'm just going to briefly read you some things because I want to pray over your offering and for your finances. Remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly, and he who sows generously that blessings may come to someone will also reap generously. Here's a key. Let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly, not sorrowfully, not under compulsion, for God loves... He takes pleasure in and prizes above all other things, is unwilling to abandon a quick to do it cheerful giver. As you pray and seek the Lord about the offering today, Billy and I are going to pray over your finances, over your offering. Father, we pray over the offering of the people. We receive this for the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. 
We thank you, Lord, that this offering comes from glad hearts, happy sowers, abundant sowers, blessed and prosperous. We believe that every person receives a great reward, a great return, even a hundredfold. Whatever their fold is, Lord, we believe it's good and it's an increase. And we thank you for it. And we believe for the blessing upon you, partners. You stand with us. You bless us. And we appreciate you. We, you've helped us preach the gospel all over the world, sent this television all over the world. You've got harvest coming. So step up and to say, I take it. I take it now. In Jesus' name, I take my harvest. You know, really, that's what we have to do where finances are concerned. We have to rise up and take it. So do that. Expect. Sow and expect your crop. Hallelujah. Watch the uh, broadcast if you missed any of them on kcm.org or on Roku channel. Billy has reminded us about the blood moon. It's coming, so yeah, don't miss it's it. it's coming this weekend, Gloria. It's so this weekend. I want you to remind you before we get back here on Monday, there will be the fourth blood moon. If okay. you need to know about the blood moons, we talked about them earlier, recorded yeah, them. You yeah. can go and find them on the archives. We're in the fourth full blood moon eclipse of the Tetrad that we've been on the holy wow. days. And it's going to be in some places, it will be the 27th, in some places the 28th okay. uh, in Fort Worth. It's going to begin. We'll be able to see it begin uh, the partial eclipse uh, about 8.07 p.m. And it's going to be over just after midnight. But if you are in Universal Time or Greenwich Mean Time, it'll be the 28th. It is the fourth moon of the Blood Moon Tetrad. And it's on the day that Sukkot Tabernacles Hallelujah. begins. Glory to Hallelujah. God. Don't miss that. This is Gloria and Billy reminding you that Jesus, Jesus is, is Lord. Lord. Thank you for joining us today on the Believer's Voice of Victory. For this week's broadcasts on DVD or MP3 on CD, go to kcm.org or call or write to us today. Remember this week's product offer. These ministry tools are designed to help you get the Word working in your life so you can experience all God has for you. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, be sure to request your free salvation package. This will help you understand who you are in Christ and how to start living your new life in victory.